let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Okay, I got Kevin Arrow. Somebody did that, so that's 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 wrong. Fine. Yep. Oh, that okay? Perfect. Kevin Arrow. Pardon? Kevin Arrow. Is that will that work? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, that I heard some lady introduce you on YouTube, and it was like okay. Yeah. Well, the real Italian is it has that Enya in there, Cavanaro. Oh but yes. Most people. We'll say Cabanaro. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, I appreciate that. I've got that here. And uh, not fussy. <laughs> we will get this posted right away on all the different podcasting networks, and I'll get that off to Crystal. Uh, video takes it usually an extra day or so, and I'll get that off to her as well. Let me spell everything that's on the screen. Now, we've got the two book. We've got, of course, you. We've got the two book covers that are rotating. And yeah. Cabanaro, I have C-A-V-A-G-N-A-R-O. Correct. Correct. Okay. That's and now natural light. That is the dot net. That's the website, right? That's right. With one L. One L. Yep. That, one word. One L. That's what I got that there, and I thought, okay, I'm going to ask about that as well. And we've got uh, all that that's up on the screen. Uh, let me do one more thing here, and then I'm set on my end. At the end of the interview, I will thank you. And I will say you're listening to This Week in America. He will disconnect us at that point. He needs time to save audio and video files before the the 130 interview. So at the end, when I say goodbye, it's actually goodbye. And it's abrupt, and I apologize for that. I wish we had a longer at the end. But as soon as we're done, he cuts us off, so he's got time to save everything. Okay. And I like to tell people that so they don't think we, uh, we hung up on them. Okay, we are all set here. I am all set. David, it looks like we are, let me see here, all set. I am going to go ahead and do a silent three-second countdown, come back to the introduction. We will jump into it. We've got about 22 minutes to, uh, to chat here, and boy, time's going to go by quickly. I'm really excited about this. So let's go ahead. I'm going to start my countdown now. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to coast, this week in America. In the late 1930s, with World War II looming, the famous German Bauhaus Art School closed, and many of its teachers migrated to America, greatly influencing the course of modern art and architecture in the 1940s and 1950s. A young artist named Milton Cavanaro began what would become a lifetime art career in San Francisco that spanned abstract painting Uh, commercial design, college teaching, jewelry making, gardening, and landscaping. Now, during this journey, many famous mid-century artists beginning their careers would grace his family's life as friends and visitors. Living art as life and life as art, mid-century artist Milton Cavanaro and five generations passing the torch of creativity by Milton's son David is lavishly illustrated, demonstrating that the definition and expression of art can permeate all of life if we also live life itself as art. David is the author of six previous books and a widely published writer and photographer in the fields of natural history and horticulture. His works published in natural calendars and magazines, including Audubon, National and International Wildlife, Natural History, Ranger Rick, and Life. Having spent most of his life in Northern California, his former home and land in Northeast Iowa had become the Pepperfield Project, a nonprofit devoted to sustainable food gardening, seed saving, and personal growth, mind, body, and spirit. David Cavanaro, author of Living Art as Life and Life as Art, is our guest on This Week in America. Hi, David. Welcome to the program. A pleasure to have you with us. Well, it's my pleasure to join you. Thank you. What an incredible story, your father, your life, all the accomplishments that you had. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Let's talk about the the inspiration behind this book, one of a half dozen that that you've done. Uh, Talk about the inspiration for this. Well, you gave the uh, background uh, very beautifully on the history of the Bauhaus and uh, what happened during the war when when, uh, Hitler drove the... uh, artists out of Germany as well. They left Germany because of the closing of the Bauhaus. Um, And my father was in art school at the California School of Fine Arts in Oakland at that time, 
when that influence began to take over art education in, um, uh, and uh, architectural education in America. And um, uh, some of those painters, uh, Bauhaus uh, painters, uh, Lionel Feininger, um, uh, uh, Kandinsky, Wassily Kandinsky, Paul Klee, uh, were household names in my growing up because my father had be been influenced by them. And um, well, fast forwarding to recent years here in Iowa, um, a very good friend of mine, a well-known potter named Dean Schwartz, invited me to go to Germany with his wife on a pursuit of studying the history of Bauhaus pottery. He is a ceramicist. And uh, I went along and uh, photographed for that uh, huge book on the history of Bauhaus ceramics and Marguerite Wildenhain, uh, whom I had known, I will tell you later in this interview, via my relationships in California. Uh, so I went along not realizing until I was photographing in the studios of these famous artists in Dessau in former Eastern Germany, that I was really on this trip to research my own father. Um, I grew up as a naturalist. I was collecting bugs and wasn't paying much attention to the art world. So the inspiration really came from wanting to dig into my own father's history. And that's what really started the whole project. It's a fascinating story. The book is available wherever books are sold, Living Art as Life and Life as Art. The, uh, the, the website for David is very simple. It's naturallight.net, only one L in there. We'll give you that as we go through the, uh, the course of the program here. The book focuses on your father's art, but both your parents were, were artists. Tell us a little bit about their backgrounds. Um. My father was born in Oakland, and as I mentioned, he went to school uh, in college at the California School of Fine Arts, uh, got an MBA in uh, secondary education, actually. But then the war came on, um, and um, you know he actually worked as a shipfitter in Sausalito, uh, Marin County, during the war, a part of the time. And um, But he took up abstract painting as a hobby at home in San Francisco during that period. And um, that eventually led to having a one-man show at the Palace of Legion of Honor in San Francisco and so forth. But he never pursued that as a career. Um, he, he ended up uh, employed uh, in a uh, design firm in San Francisco, helped found it actually, um, and uh, did commercial design for quite a while. Then he got into teaching. Um, um, he took a summer course at the Rudolf Schaefer School of Design, and um, that would have been uh, in the mid-30s, and um, um, eventually ended up teaching at both of those schools that he, that he went to. But meanwhile, in Kansas City, Missouri, my mother had become quite interested in art, uh, going to the um, uh, junior college of, of, of uh, Kansas, junior college in Kansas City. And... Um, she got a, a degree in, um, in uh, primary education, actually. But then she took a job, uh, along with a few other uh, designers, as J.C. Hall's first greeting card designers in the young uh, ah. Hallmark Art Company. Yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, and she, she was a fabulous artist. In the book, there's some beautiful uh, illustrations from her college years uh, that, she, that she did, portraiture, really gorgeous gorgeous stuff. So she was a very, very competent artist. Well, then she ended up signing up for the same summer course in San Francisco uh, at the Rudolph Schaefer School, and that's where she met my father. Um, then my father Milton and Rudolph Schaefer conspired to get my mother May Reese back to San Francisco the following year, and she then, in 1936, uh, was in San Francisco again, and that was when the Golden Gate Bridge was only half built. <laughs> wow. So uh, wow. at any rate, that's where their relationship began. And uh, from there on, um, they continued together. My father eventually gave up both teaching and commercial design, fled San Francisco in 1949 for a little tiny cracker box house in Marin County. Uh, that cost $8,000 at 
and they had to do it on a 30-year mortgage, if you can imagine <laughs> uh, how poor they were. Um, but uh, my father then started his, uh, his jewelry business. Let me just show you a couple of photos here uh, to back up uh, a couple of these points. Yes. Uh, his abstract art, um, uh, you can see uh, a little bit of it here. Let me get it. So oh, yes. Cheap. Very mm -hmm. nice. Uh, these are some of the uh, pieces of artwork at the time that he was more or less being influenced by the Bauhaus uh, artists uh, who were pioneering abstract art. But once he got into uh, his jewelry making, um, he really began to exercise his life philosophy, which was marching to his own drummer. He refused to be a joiner. He never paid much attention to the art world. He wanted to pioneer his own work. And his jewelry was very iconoclastic. It's, uh, you know, let me see if I can show you just a few. Um, yeah, very impressive. Um, you'll see that a lot of these pieces of jewelry, necklaces, and pendants were actually made out of bone. We literally you know, composted our soup bones and he cleaned them up and carved them up like ivory into beautiful <laughs> jewelry. Anyway, he developed over the next decade a very, very successful um, jewelry business, coast to coast, um, selling in some of the finest outlets in America. Um, and then finally, he did, one day decided it was time to make yet another change and he walked out, the stu out of his basement studio door uh, took a job as a maintenance gardener, and then, of course, as an artist, living his life as art, he ended up in landscape design, and that was his final artistic career. What an interesting career and background. Our guest is David Cavanaro, and I will spell that for you if you're Googling. That's C-A-V-A-G-N-A-R-O. The book is Living Art as Life and Life as Art, the book available wherever books are sold. David's website is brightlight.net and uh, naturallight.net. And natural light is uh, with one L. So it's natural, uh, N-A-T-U-R-A-L-I-G-H-T dot net. Don't want to confuse it more, and I think I just probably did, but naturallight.net with one L. Book is available, Barnes & Noble at Amazon, Dorrance Publishing, all of the usual places. So, uh, David, what prompted you in writing this story to include the next generation? Where did that idea come from? Well, it was quite fascinating that this project really, uh, as I told you, started entirely around the idea of just talking about my father's career, given the fact that now, as all of you know, you know the mid-century uh, uh, was a period of great artistic and architectural ferment in America. And I thought that my father's associations and his work would be a contribution to that history. But then it occurred to me, well, gee whiz, the entire family, starting with my maternal Italian grandmother, whose artistry was in the kitchen, you know, all the way through to my father and my uncle, and, uh, and then myself, uh, my children, and now my grandchildren, and all the spouses involved. I mean, the entire clan, uh, has you know demonstrated uh, art in so many different forms. Um, the other piece I wanted to emphasize to it too, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the diversity of our media. Um, the Bauhaus uh, mantra uh, in Germany was uh, "Let nature be your only goddess." Uh, in other words, it was sort of founded on the principle of letting nature define. Um, uh, define the inspiration behind art. Yes. Well, that was true, as I realized, as I thought about our family, it was true not only of my mother and father, who were born naturalists, uh, but it has been true of everybody, the entire, uh, the entire family. So that was a theme. Um, the other thing I wanted to emphasize is that there was a difference between the way the torch, the creative torch was passed in our family compared to that historical uh, passage in the Bauhaus tradition, because there it was among the guilds where often in a single family, a, a particular skill, be it pottery or uh, some other art form painting was transferred 
um, through the guild system, yes. uh, masters, yes. training, interns, and apprentices, so to speak. Wasn't true in our family at all. We were all renegades, you know, we were all <laughs> to our own drummer. And so we just came up with whatever artistry we were inspired to explore. And I realized that my father's um, uh, courage to change directions and careers even at a moment's notice when he felt that one chapter had come to an end and it was time to begin another chapter of life. That gave us all a similar courage. And so the results is that the art forms, let me just give you a couple of examples here. Um, um, my own art form was was mostly then photography, and I, I became here's some of my my nature. Oh, I, yeah, I said lavishly uh, uh, illustrated and, and uh, photography. Well, That's beautiful. I've done so much. Uh, you know, I've uh, there's 300 books in horticulture alone that have my photographs in them. You know, and that was just the horticulture recent chapter. So I've been doing this uh, photography for very many years. Um, another example, um, uh, let me see if I can find it here. Um, the book, by the way, while David's getting us some pictures, and in fact, I'll direct you to YouTube. If you go to YouTube and Google, you'll find us. Go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Hit videos. You'll find the video version of this. See some of the examples that David's talking about. And, of course, go to his website, naturallight.net, one L in that, naturallight.net. Uh, all this information on this book and so many others that David has written on, the, uh, on his website. Let me show you another art form. I told you that my maternal grandmother started the food tradition. Well, here's some of the artistry that my... Oh, uh, yes. These are just uh, uh, the way we serve food in our family. These are desserts and salads, salad plates that we, you know, my, my, my daughter and I uh, have done these particular dishes. So food has been, uh, been an art form. Um, um, wonderfully laid out i'd be afraid to eat anything it's so beautiful i would like to would not like to uh, disturb the picture this is the artwork that i did when i was a senior in high school for my high school yearbook you know so it yes. started a long time with me and i want to just show you one more real quick one here uh you see the, the talent in, with David and the family. It's just an incredible story and uh, a very fascinating book. Oh, this is, oh, animals there. Well, I wanted to emphasize that the artistry was not just genetic. The, the, the spouses in, in the family uh, contributed enormously. Uh, my first uh, wife, Maggie, did these incredible block prints for the book we published called Almost Home. Um, and she had never done block prints before in her life. You know, it, it was just one of those uh, one of those things that she decided to do and perfected. And, um, and and one last one, just to give you another example. These are my grandchildren uh, making uh, art on the beach, you know, walk, <laughs> walking <laughs> uh, spirals on the beach. So uh, there's just been these many art forms. They've included painting, collage, weaving, music teaching, writing, photography, block printing. Uh, even my engineer son, uh, you know, uh, used restoring antique automobiles as an art form. And in addition, has become a great artistic cook and a great photographer. So we covered the gamut. And all of that is in the in this book with all the interesting stories that go along with it. Well, the title is appropriate, Living Art as Life and Life as Art by David Cavanaro, our guest on the program. The website is naturallight.net with, with one L. In the book, you devoted an entire chapter to photographers Hansel and, and Otto Hegel. Uh, why were they so important in your life? Well, uh, that all began really, uh, there's a chapter in the book called Visitors at the Round Table. Um, one of the great things about our family is that we all ate together around the round table, and, and my sister and I were always involved in the many eclectic artists and guests who came there. Um, uh, many of them became quite famous eventually. Ansel Adams uh, had first come to my father to have him help Ansel design his first portfolios. Uh, Imogen Cunningham, um, uh, 
uh, the first woman on the staff of Life magazine came came for dinner, and her co-worker, Johanna Meath, also later called Hansel, uh, who married Otto Hegel, was the second woman with Marguerite on the staff of Life magazine. I met them and eventually came to own uh, half of their land in Sonoma County. They became enormous mentors for me. They had, uh, they were famous photographers in their own right, you know, photographing. Well, first of all, Otto was FDR's White House photographer for a while. Uh, Hansel and Otto photographed the likes of uh, Herbert Hoover, Einstein, uh, Henry Kaiser, um, R- Rosie the Riveter. <laughs> wow, <laughs> yes. And uh, became very close friends of the widow of Jack London. And there's a photograph Otto took of Charmian in, in Jack London's studio in the book. So they became not only mentors to me, but I wanted the chapter in the book because they represented so much the same philosophy of living life as art and artist life um, as I tried to portray. The other connection was that Otto was the main photographer of this same Bauhaus ceramicist, Marguerite Wildenheim, whom I had followed to Germany because she had a pottery pottery studio in Sonoma County. uh, And, uh, and also then turned out to be connected to Luther College and Dean Schwartz, the ceramicist here in Decora. So <laughs> the first chapter in the book called Synchronicity in the Guided Universe is very important to the philosophy of this entire, um, this entire record because uh, all of these threads are interconnected. Well, I want to ask you about it. Tim is going by so quickly. Our guest on the program is David Caronaro. The book is Living Art as Life and Life as Art. You mentioned that. What, did, what would be the central message behind Living Art as Life and Life as Art? Reflecting on the title, what do you hope the message is that people uh, take away from you uh, after reading the book? I really feel like people are very hungry right now for authenticity and for connectedness at this time of critical transformation on the earth and and the uplifting of consciousness that's going on. And I just feel really strongly it's important for us to realize that art is not something separate from living. Uh, my father had a, a mantra, we make our biggest impact on the world by the way we lead our own lives. And I feel that we are all potentially artists simply in the way we lead our own life. And I've written down this one line uh, about what that means. Uh, It means living a life of love, love for the earth, love for each other, and by that I mean all others, and and sharing, uh, sharing what we know and sharing our love in service to the planet and to the world. Then life itself becomes the art you have to offer. I think that's the central message. Boy, and and there's so much there for all of us. It's a a fascinating read visually as well as the the text that David has put together. I mentioned author of of six books. You also recently published another currently available, The Luna Moth Papers, Mirrors for One Another in Real Time, a 20-year exchange of letters with my English teacher. Briefly, what was that about? And is that connected in any way to, to this book? It's very much connected, actually. I wrote that one first, and then I I wrote the the next year this one, published them both myself on my uh, my little publishing company, Natural Light uh, uh, Press, and um, now they're both being being picked up and republished. They are connected philosophically for sure because my English teacher and I shared. Uh, this 20-year amazing correspondence all through the tumultuous 1960s, 70s, and 80s, uh, moon landing, um, you know, civil rights movement, oh, all yes. of the war, and really the messages are very much the same, um, that we really need to get reconnected with the earth, um, to Mother Earth and, and, uh, and nature, and get reconnected with each other and truly live our lives as a work of art. 
And you're doing that, and you you've talked about your you you do talk about the career in the book, the new career, the horticultural photography. I mean, your photography is so amazing. You've had animal species named after you with the expeditions that you've been on. I'd love to do a show just talking about all the background and all that you've seen in your amazing career, which continues to this day. And I mentioned the books that are available. Mention the website. I understand that you would do autograph copies of uh, of your books. Yes, I do. Thank you for mentioning that. I, I want to stress that I, I, I would love to sell both books myself personally, because then I can give you, the reader, the chance for a personalized autograph. And um, also my contact information, uh, my email, which is my preference for communicating, is on the website. Uh, simply my name, David Period Cabanaro at uh, gmail.com. And I relish communication with my readers in person and uh, am happy to uh, engage in philosophical discussions around all of these issues we're talking about. And you would love to have those with David. You would learn something in having a correspondence with David. Again, our guest, David Cavanaro, that's C-A-V as in Victor, A-G-N-A-R-O. Uh, you'll find his book available, what books available, wherever books are sold, send you to his website where you can get autographed copies, naturallight.net, one L in that book available, of course, at Doran's Publishing Company, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. I want to thank uh, kingspagespress.com, the author's marketing consultant, for arranging our conversation today. Uh, so much in all of his books. Uh, it'll be a learning experience, a pleasurable learning experience in reading uh, all of the books. David, it's been a pleasure. Time has gone by way too quickly. We can use hours to talk about what all you've done and what all your family has done. What a remarkable life that uh, that you've led, led by your parents. Thank you so much for being with us on the program. It's certainly been my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. It has been our pleasure, and hopefully we can do it again. David Cavanaro, our guest on the program, his website, naturallight.net, 1L. Link for that on our website, thisweekinamerica.us. And we're back on today's program right after these messages. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bechet, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC, for information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again at thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.